Right, I guess we can get started then. Okay, so um, this is the intro to finite element analysis. Welcome everyone that's already here. Um, this is going to be going through uh, some of the technical side of finite element analysis or FEA for specifically formless students, FSAE. Um, my name is Colm. I'm the head of aerodynamics at uh, Formula Trinity. Used to be head of suspension as well until I was uh, succeeded by someone better, Killian. He's uh, here and he's ready to answer any questions if any come in. Um, but yeah, I've also uh, spent a year at a simulation company, SimScale. Uh, working as an application and product engineer. So uh, I've been using this fairly regularly. So hopefully some of the things that come out of today will be useful for everyone that's in here. Okay, so an overview of what I'll be going through. So I'll be going through some of the basics and some of the not so basics really. Um, so the basics really covers just uh, what in general is FEA and how to do it uh, on a basic level. And then the not so basics are specific applications that we see in Formula Student specifically. Uh, so this would be stuff like fatigue, optimization, uh, and dynamics. And then at the end, uh, if there's any time, that we might be running short on time by the end of it, uh, I'll be taking any questions if anyone has any more questions. But uh, you might be fed up by that stage because this could go on. Uh, well, it won't go on too long, but uh, hopefully not too long. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to give you some pictures about what will be covered, um, so the, uh, I'll be going through two examples throughout the entire thing. Uh, one of them is the Monash Motorsport rear, rear bulkhead, which you can see there on the left. And this is an optimized part, a structurally optimized part. Um, we'll be going through that. And the one on the right there is also a structurally optimized, uh, more rigorous optimized, you could say, because it's 3D printed. Uh, and that's from NTNU. Um, and that's one of their suspension uprights. And we'll be going through that later. Okay, so first, what is finite element analysis? The uh, key question behind all of this. So there's three typical ways to conduct a stress analysis of a part to make sure that it's structurally sound through the loads that it's being um, seeing throughout its life. Uh, the first way is through analytical methods. So you could get out an equation for something like an I-beam uh, and then calculate how much stress is going through that I-beam, for example. Um, the problem with this is that it only works for simple geometries uh, and for geometries which are typically complex and not exactly like a specific beam, that doesn't really work. There's then experimental ways of uh, doing a structural analysis, uh, but this is expensive and typically destructive as well. Uh, and then the third way, which is finite elements analysis, is computationally. So this is a computational simulation which we're talking about. Uh, but ca caution must be taken to make sure that you're doing the simulation correctly. Otherwise, you could get results out that look okay, but could be completely wrong. That's just the nature of it. So this is just some word vomit here. Um, just some basic uh, kind of definitions. So what is finite element analysis again? It's a simulation. It's a computer simulation based on the finite element method, uh, which uh, simulates different physical phenomena, in our case, uh, the stress through a part, uh, structural equilibrium. Um, and how does it do this? It breaks down the problem into smaller chunks called a mesh. Uh, and within each of these chunks, uh, the equations that govern that physical phenomenon are solved. Uh, so you create a mesh of an entire part and the governing equations will be solved in each tiny section of the part. So it essentially breaks down the problem into smaller pieces. Uh, in a mathematical way. So we can use finite element analysis for uh, stress analyses, uh, magnetic interactions, thermal dissipation, and a lot more. Um, but we'll be going through here, obviously, like I said before, it's structural analysis. And then finally, remembering that some models are, or all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, FEA is a model of a model. So it's very easy to produce a model that might look okay and fine but in fact, isn't any use to you and it's telling you the wrong results. So uh, that's typically the thing that we want to avoid when we're doing FEA. And that's essentially the reason we're giving this talk. So second of all, numerical methods. I'm going to briefly go through numerical methods uh, just so that we get an understanding of the basics behind FEA, what's going on behind the scenes. So 
a numerical method is an approximation to an analytical equation. Uh, typically, um, the equation, uh, the equation which we're modeling, the analytical analytical equation has a closed form solution, so you can write it down on a piece of paper and get a number out. But that's not always the case. And um, for stuff like CFD, where the uh, analytical equation behind the entire thing is the Navier-Stokes equations. You can't get a, a direct answer out from those. So you have to take a numerical method approximation of these things. Uh, and you can see an animation of a numerical method there on the right. So the blue line is the analytical or closed form solution. That's the exact solution. And then a numerical method is that kind of piecewise linear graph that uh, approximates the solution. Uh, so on, yeah, on the right hand side, there is uh, an example of Euler's method and the improved Euler correction method approximating some one dimensional function. Um, and the way that FEA works is very similar to this. This is a one dimensional function. FEA just analyzes a three dimensional function. So uh, the on the right here is uh, an example of the finite difference method, um, which is another uh, numerical method and it's a uh, kind of modeling the uh, one dimensional Poisson equation. And you can see the math mathematical representation of that above the um, kind of graph there at the bottom. And you can see it's a pretty large matrix by the end. Uh, but what we do is we break up the domain into little chunks. So uh, we discretize the domain um, and then we solve the equation at each one of these uh, little nodes, we call them. And then the more nodes there are, the closer to the analytical function that we'll get. So the more accuracy we'll get. Um, and this, uh, although this example on the right-hand side is of a one-dimensional function, this holds for three-dimensional functions as well. The more dense your mesh and the more nodes which you have, the closer to the analytical function which you're gonna get. Uh, so this is the Poisson equation which it's modeling. Uh, generally, uh, for numerical methods that we're gonna be talking about, the equations which we're modeling are going to be uh, partial differential equations or PDEs. So uh, this just gives an example of the dim dimensionality of uh, these problems. So these are all uh, numerical method simulations of the uh, heat equation, which is shown up there. Um, so on the left is a one dimensional representation of it, uh, which is just obviously a line. And then the middle is a two dimensional representation. Uh, and then the right is uh, a three-dimensional representation, but it's on a 2D surface so that it's easy to see. Uh, but this just gives an intuitive understanding behind the dimensions that we're talking about here. So it does carry over from, the, the things I've been talking about with one dimension do carry over into three-dimensional uh, numerical simulation. Uh, and numerical methods are quite useful to um, study different physical phenomena. So here we can see this would be a finite element analysis of some kind of crash that's going on. Uh, and this would be an explicit uh, finite element method, numerical method. Um, but it, the usefulness of numerical methods go, goes beyond this. So uh, it has use in biomedical applications like in see, you can see here, um, mechanical engineering uh, things just in general. So this uh, mostly I'm showing CFD here which is computational fluid dynamics, uh, another different type of numerical method, which is based on the finite volume method. Um, and then it has a range of other areas as well, such as uh, electromagnetism there on the left and dynamic FEA there on the right. But what we use it for at Formula Student at Formula Trinity is for mainly structural analysis and CFD, like I've been talking about. So the examples there on the left-hand side are FEA, which is what we're gonna be going through today. And then on the right is uh, obviously a different type of numerical method, which we might cover another day, but um, it's similar in form because numerical methods are all quite similar in what they want to achieve. Okay, so the finite element method. Um, now I'm gonna warn you guys, I have two slides of maths here, uh, but I swear that's all that I have. Um, so don't, don't get scared when you see two slides of maths, um, but they're a tiny bit later. So uh, the main problem with doing FEA in college is that it's uh, seen as a black box. And this is um, kind of a detrimental point for a lot of uh, employers that uh, students come out of college 
knowing how to do FEA, as in they know how to press the different buttons and get a pretty picture out at the end, but they actually have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And because of that, they have no idea whether what they're doing is correct. Uh, this approach is often called garbage in, garbage out. You don't know what you're putting into the system. Uh, you don't know what you're getting out. And then FEA makes a good engineer better and a poor engineer dangerous. So because we're doing structural analysis, a lot of this um, depends on a, the safety of a lot of things depends on finite elements analysis. So getting it right is really key in some areas. Okay, so this is the first slide of maths. We'll be past it soon if you want to tone out, tone out but I, I want to get uh, this out there really. So if we imagine a spring that uh, on either side isn't fixed in space, so it's free to displace in either direction, uh, we can analyze this spring with Hooke's law, which is F is equal to KU. So the force is equal to the stiffness times the displacement. Uh, and then in the middle there, you can see, I can show you with my mouse here. And um, this is the equations that we get out of this. So uh, we're just taking the displacement at either side of this spring with the stiffness of the spring. So this is a simple one dimensional representation of uh, the Hooke's law through this spring element. And then we can arrange this system of equations into a matrix, uh, which is shown down here. So this is a two degree of freedom, two by two matrix, which represents this one dimensional spring element. Uh, and you can see this matrix over here is what we're going to be calling from now on the stiffness matrix, because obviously the K is the stiffness in this problem. Then U represents the displacements, and then F represents the applied forces. Now, if we just extend this one more time to a system of two springs, uh, so this is uh, two springs in series, two one-dimensional springs, uh, we go through the same kind of method of getting these equations out and forming them into matrices. And we get a slightly larger um, stiffness matrix out at the end with uh, three components in force and displacements. And you can see I've put a little box over two sections here. So this orange box here represents the first spring element and this blue box here represents the second spring element. And it's important to note um, when we're doing FEA, we're typically not looking at one dimensional problems. We're looking at three dimensional continuous problems. So um, uh, the dependency of one element will be on more than just its neighbor. So uh, there'll be more entries than just the diagonal entries. Uh, but these typically represent the elements in the problem. Uh, so you can identify elements in the stiffness matrix like this. Uh, but that's just a minor point. Um, so this is just uh, a big picture, really, um, <laughs> that, that'll show you just what's going on. So we have F equals KU, uh, where F is a column matrix of applied forces, K is equal K is a stiffness matrix and U is the displacement matrix. This is the governing equation behind uh, finite element analysis and what our numerical method tries to solve. Um, so we apply these forces through um, boundary conditions and things like that. And we want to, at the end of the day, get our displacements out. So the goal of FEA is to get our displacements out of the system. And from our displacement, displacements, we can calculate our stresses and strains and everything else like that. So the way that we go about solving this equation is we invert the stiffness matrix and then multiply it against the force column matrix. And then we get the uh, displacement matrix, displacement column matrix out of there. So that's really all that's going on behind the scenes in FEA, okay? Now, reality is a tiny bit more complex. Um, the finite element method is for a discretizing a continuous media. Uh, or rather it can do uh, different dimensional problems, but the problems we're gonna be looking at are for a 3D continuum, it's called. Um, so the equations are a bit more difficult uh, and the kind of understanding behind it is a tiny bit more difficult, uh, but I'm not gonna go into all the details of that. If you're a Formula Trinity member and you want to understand the details and the maths behind all of that, I recommend looking at Kill Killian's videos if you want to understand uh, the strong form for FEM or the finite element method. Or if you're interested in the finite volume method, I've done a video on the Navier-Stokes equations and putting them into the finite volume method uh, for that. So uh, I recommend checking those two things out if you're interested.
Okay, so now we get into some actual FEA pictures. So um, if we assume that a body is going to deform in space in some unknown way, it, there's going to be an infinite amount of ways which it can deform. So it's going to have infinite degrees of freedom. So when we discretize this problem or break it up into smaller chunks, um, these chunks um, at the corner of each of these chunks is going to be nodes. So you can see down here in the right hand side, I've shown one chunk here. And then the corner of this element is called a node. And this is where all of our values are kept. Uh, and if we apply a boundary condition, it's going to be applied at our nodes. So really in the computer's memory, it stores all of the stresses and strains and displacements for nodal values. Okay, And that's for the finite element method. Um, but since we've broken up this problem into a finite set of nodes or a finite set of elements, that's where finite element methods comes from, uh, now it has a finite amount of degrees of freedom. So we've gone from a infinite amount of degrees of freedom in the continuous problem to a, a finite degree amount of degrees of freedom in the uh, discretized problem. Okay. And one point to get out of the way. So uh, the nodes will be on uh, the element corners for a linear element, but we can also have quadratic elements, um, which also have nodes at the midpoints of each corner. And we can go further than that as well and have nodes at more of the midpoints as well. Um, but typically what this does is it allows for a quadratic interpolation between these two edge nodes. So the way that the stress is interpolated through this element is typically linear if you want to keep just nodes at the edges or if you want to um, increase the uh, kind of polynomial interpretation polynomial uh, interpolation so that will be using a polynomial shape function it's called uh, we can get a, a non-linear uh, distribution of stress through this element um, which allows the element to capture curvature and things like that. So um, what I'm saying here is really use quadratic elements when you can, because they're more accurate and they represent the stress field better and they can also capture curvature. Uh, but for uh, analysis like stress analysis or not stress analysis, sorry, for analysis like thermal analysis, uh, you can stick to linear elements because uh, the uh, problem is a linear problem. But for finite element analysis and structural analysis, um, we stick to quadratic elements here. And that's the default for ANSYS as well. OK, so just a brief name clarification before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, exactly how to do a finite element analysis. Um, the finite element method is a numerical method to solve these problems. Um, and the finite element analysis is a use of the finite element method. So you use the finite element method to conduct a finite element analysis. And a finite element analysis refers to the study of stress through a structure, OK? But the finite element method can be used for other types of analysis, such as thermal, buckling, and dynamic studies as well. Um, there is other numerical methods as well, like the finite volume method, which I've spoken about. And that's typically used in CFD or electromagnetism. And then there's also the finite difference method, um, which is an older method and used often to teach uh, numerical methods, but it's still used for things like thermal analysis. OK, now uh, that's kind of the brief overview of what FEA is. Uh, I'm going to go through a bit of the meshing side of things now. Uh, so like I mentioned in the structure beforehand, we'll go through meshing, then boundary conditions, then post-processing. Uh, so if we start off with meshing, uh, we have to understand what is a mesh. So we spoke earlier about discretizing the domain, and this is breaking the domain into these elements or chunks. Um, so we want to divide our geometry into a set of discrete uh, shapes or elements. So the goal of this is to uh, break the geometry down into little chunks where we can solve our governing equations in each chunk. OK, so um, the density of the mesh or the size of the elements directly correlates with the accuracy of our solution. So if our elements are smaller, that means that we're going to get a more accurate solution in that area because there's uh, more equations going on and the uh, space on which the equation is solved is smaller. So you can capture uh, larger stress gradients by using a, a denser mesh. Okay. Uh, 
So because of this, the mesh should be refined in areas of importance, such as high stress regions. So you can see that up here on the top right hand side, we have a coarse mesh, it's called, and we have a, a stress concentration over here, which is in red. Uh, we want to refine the mesh around this area so that we can get a, a good representation of how it actually looks. Okay. Now, for this case, it, the stress here doesn't actually change too much as we increase the mesh density, but this isn't always the case. Sometimes when we increase mesh density, the solution can change dramatically. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves, what is a good mesh? Because there is such thing as a bad mesh. So the accuracy of the result is dependent on the size of the elements like I've before. Um, but going to uh, much into it, like using too many elements and using too fine of a mesh can also lead to a solution that solve. Uh, so we want to use as simple and as coarse a mesh as possible, but no coarser. Okay. So the first thing that we want to make sure is that the uh, discretized domain or the mesh captures our geometry. So we can see here that this mesh doesn't particularly capture the geometry because the circle that's in the middle or the bolt hole uh, is kind of blocky and it's not great. And there's also only one element that goes from the edge into the middle of the circle. So there's only one node here and maybe one node on the midpoint here. And that's the only places where we're solving for stress. So we're not actually doing a good job of capturing the stress gradient across this part. Um, and as well as this, you can see that we have uh, some very skewed elements here. So this, this essentially, uh, we can understand it right now, is an element with a bad shape. So this element is very, very skewed. I don't really know a better word to call it, but um, this, uh, this side here is very small and the other sides are very big. That's all that I can say. But uh, yeah, this, this isn't going to perform well in our finite element method. And typically we want to use a, a more structured and a better mesh really. And what is a better mesh? It's this one down here on the left. And um, this is an example of a good mesh. So you can see that it captures the geometry pretty well around this hole. And it's also structured and the shape of each element is very well defined and its volume is very nice, okay? So it's a structured, nice looking mesh. Most of the time that you can tell whether a mesh is good just by looking at it because it will look nice. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. Um, but yeah, that's about that. Uh, so there's different types of mesh elements which we can use. So remember that the elements are the little chunks which we've broken the solution down into. There's different shapes that we can break it into, really. Uh, there's tetrahedral, hexahedral, wedge, and pyramid elements. Um, now, there's these all have different properties uh, which we can go into. But tetrahedral elements will allow us to capture a geometry a tiny bit better, but they're not as efficient as hexahedral elements. Okay, so uh, typically we want to favor hex when we can, and I'll also call these hex and tet. Uh, typically, we want to favor favor hex when we can, because it's more efficient and a bit more accurate. Um, but TET will allow us to just create a mesh very quickly uh, and just slap a load of refinement on it and just get a result out quickly that's nice and accurate, OK? So often the choice of TET or hex will depend on the geometry of the structure. So sometimes, because hex is very blocky, uh, it doesn't really conform well to geometries that aren't blocky. So you'll use a hex mesh for a geometry that is lucky looking and a tet mesh for a smooth geometry, you could say, okay? Uh, so I have an example here. This is an example of a blocky geometry and we can use a hex mesh for this. Um, so yeah, this geometry is favorable for hex mesh because hex can more accurately or more efficiently capture the geometry. Now we have this cow down here in the that isn't a blocky thing. So uh, it's not a blocky cow. Uh, it's a beefy boy, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a curved continuous uh, surface that we have here. So it's more favorable towards tetrahedral elements. Um, and you might've seen as well, we have, I popped up a polyhedral cell here. Uh, 
it's just the other type of cell which we have. We're not going to use it in FEA, so don't worry about it. I just want to be thorough with that. But yeah, uh, the choice of element will often depend on, or will often be hinged on the type of geometry which you have and what the tree will favor. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to skip through a lot of the next few slides because I have um, a lot of tips on how to make a mesh. So the exact buttons which you can press in ANSYS. Um, and this will be going up online later. Uh, so if you're watching this at a later point, pause the video and kind of read through the slide. But I won't be going through it here because uh, it'll go in through one side and out the other because it's uh, pretty boring stuff just telling you what button to press, really. Uh, but this is just how to create a mesh, how to create a hex mesh, how to create a tet mesh, and how to make sure they're good kind of thing. Okay, so we can see some nice pretty pictures there. Hex mesh on the right, left-hand side, uh, tet mesh on the right-hand side. So you can see that this is a curved geometry that favors tet mesh, and this is a more blocky geometry that might favor hex meshing. Okay. Now, this is where I skip through a, a bit of things. Uh, skipping this. I'll keep it up for a second just so people can pause later though. Yeah, and here you can as well see, this is similar to the geometry I showed earlier. So this does have a hex mesh with it, but internal here is an actual uh, tet mesh internally. Um, so this is an interesting case, uh, but my uh, assumption is that this is actually CFD. Okay, we can skip on a few more times. This is exactly how to use a multi-zone and sweep and thin sweep, which are uh, tools which you can use to set up a mesh. And then your global controls and what they all mean. Um, how to do different refinements, regions, local controls. Um, and this is just going through biases, which is a option that comes up in a lot of different uh, mesh types. And uh, this is more region refinements. Then. This is generating a mapped or structured meshing. So you can see uh, this is how you go from kind of a ugly looking, but still rather accurate uh, mesh over here to a more structured mesh, which you can be more reliable or which can be more reliable. Uh, and this is just geometry defeaturing, which we call, which, which we say. Um, so sometimes the geometry can be difficult for the finite element method to solve. So we have to what's called defeature it, or we have to get rid of a few features of it. And um, so if we have some small indentation, like just say we've pressed in the name of Form and Eternity onto some part, and the like pressing length, you could say the pressing thickness is like half a millimeter, and that won't affect the structural integrity of the part. Uh, that's going to be difficult to mesh because it's such a small kind of indentation. So typically we'll just get rid of it, um, because if we don't, it'll cause very small elements to be made in that area, which will slow down the process uh, and cause accuracy issues as well. Okay. Um, yeah, and here I have just a page on inflations, which are more useful for uh, CFD, uh, but they can still be useful for generating a mesh around holes in FEA, I've found. I, and this is just on the mesh decomposition of a part. So you can use hex and tet mesh on the same part. Uh, it'll just require a bit of kind of um, changing uh, between the two. So you'll have a layer that might uh, cause this transition between the two, but you can uh, use this. And you can also do it without the transition. That would be what's called a non-conformal mesh. So if the nodes don't exactly line up with each other on either side, that's what's called a non-conformal mesh but I'll keep on going through here. So symmetry is actually a really useful one. So uh, this would typically be a, a boundary condition. Um, so we can simplify some of our geometries down because they're symmetrical or, or axisymmetrical sometimes. Um, and the finite element method can account for this and uh, it won't cause any loss in accuracy really. So uh, you can see here on the top right hand side, we have a part which is what's called axisymmetric, right? So uh, it's axisymmetric uh, in quarters, right? So we can split this up into a quarter, tell the program that we have a quarter of this and that it's axisymmetric. So the program expects to have three more around it, uh, but it can solve just one of them, just one of these uh, quarters and get out the result for that and then just extrapolate it out to the rest of it. And it won't cause a loss in accuracy, that kind of thing. Uh, 
And then we can also do it with just uh, straight symmetry conditions, which is if a part is uh, symmetrical about some plane, um, we can also tell it that that's the case and the solver will account for that as well. Now it's important to note that not only does the geometry have to be symmetrical, but the applied forces need to be symmetrical as well. So um, just say on this one on the top right hand side, uh, if we had a force that was applied to this bolt hole here, but not applied to this bolt hole over here, we then couldn't assume axisymmetric conditions. We would have to um, model the entire thing. So the not just the geometry needs to be symmetrical, but the forces and everything else needs to be symmetrical too. Okay, so uh, getting into a talk about mesh quality, uh, sometimes the mesh quality can cause numerical issues. So um, we typically we want a good shape of our elements to ensure numerical accuracy. And you can see down here on the bottom right hand side, uh, a good mesh, which is this structured hexahedral mesh, can generate uh, this kind of stress structure, which you see through it. But a bad mesh, which has very skewed and bad looking elements, can generate uh, bad results because of actual numerical errors. So this is uh, errors that aren't present because of boundary conditions that you've applied, but are actually due to bad mesh used in the finite element method itself, the numerical side of things. So we want to ensure that we uh, can generate a good mesh and rely on our results really. So uh, how do we tell if a mesh is good? Well, number one, a good mesh follows the CAD model. So it captures the geometry well, that's the most important thing. And then second, uh, it must be tied to the underlying physics. Uh, so this is more to do, uh, this, is a, this is a kind of CFD example, but it stands for um, FEA as well. If you have flow moving through a part, typically you want a mesh that will uh, flow, not flow with it, but um, not create inaccuracies along that flow direction. And then third, this is the one that often students um, kind of miss out on. And it's also uh, almost the most important one. Uh, if you listen to any lecture, it'll probably tell you that this is the most important one. No mesh is perfect, do a refinement study. So uh, your results might depend on your mesh. So you might not have a fine enough mesh to capture re your results accurately but still give you an answer. It will always give you an answer. Um, but if it's not refined enough, that answer can be dependent on the mesh. So you want to make sure that your result is what's called mesh independent. And the way that you do this is by changing the mesh several times and making sure that the result doesn't change, okay? And when I say change the mesh, I mean increase its fineness. Uh, increase its density around these high stress areas. So we'll get into mesh refinement studies a tiny bit later, uh, but that's almost the most important thing when it comes to mesh quality, more so than any um, kind of method that I was talking about beforehand, okay? So uh, I have an example here of different meshes and um, they all typically give a different result. So, uh, if you did your first analysis on this left-hand side mesh over here and you got a result out, it's not good enough, quite simply, to just accept that and move on because all of these other meshes actually give different results. So the problem that we have here isn't mesh independent yet. We haven't found a result that's independent of the mesh. So we can ask ourselves, which is the best of these meshes which we see here? But the answer is actually none of them because none of them have proven themselves to be mesh independent. They all need a finer mesh to make sure that that result isn't dependent on that mesh, okay? Now, I, I'm also gonna skip through a bit of these. And um, so these are the exact quality metrics. So the shape of the element, which induces numerical errors if it's bad, um, can be uh, kind of, analyzed through looking at the mesh quality, which is a kind of post-processing feature which we have within ANSYS. So you can actually look at a mesh quality plots within ANSYS that will tell you just how good your mesh is. But it importantly won't tell you whether it's mesh independent. You have to do that yourself. Um, but these are just some quality metrics, we call them. So this one here uh, is aspect ratio. Uh, and 
these these are typically things which you can color the mesh by in ANSYS. Um, so you'll see those uh, when you go to check the quality of a mesh in ANSYS or any FEA tool. Uh, so this one here is Jacobian ratio, just so you can get an understanding of how it looks. Um, uh, obviously one here means that uh, it has a good Jacobian ratio and the mesh is good, but 1000 means that it has a bad Jacobian ratio and it's gonna induce numerical errors, okay? Uh, and then we have skewness as well. And I bring back up the uh, concept of the uh, meshed cow here. Skewness is one of the more important mesh quality metrics. Uh, so definitely do keep an eye on this one. Uh, Non-orthogonality. Now this one is a bit difficult to wrap your head around really. Um, but I have a chart here on the left-hand side that will tell you whether your non-orthogonality non is good or not. Um, and it's important to note that uh, an unacceptable non-orthogonality or an unacceptable mesh quality metric for any of these other ones will cause numerical error. So they will actually cause the solution to not finish or in some cases just break down completely. So you want to ensure that you have a good mesh in regards to your uh, mesh quality metrics. And this is what a mesh quality metric plot looks like. So you can see that here, uh, the user is looking at something like uh, general element quality, which is something that ANSYS offers. And you can also see a histogram of the amount of elements which are within some uh, bin of uh, element quality. So uh, you want to minimize the number of elements which are essentially considered to be bad uh, in shape. Okay. Uh, and now we get on to mesh independence. So if you get anything out of today, um, it, it should be this, that your solution has to be mesh independent for it to be kind of accurate and noteworthy. Um, for those of us in Formula Trinity um, or any Formula student team that's here, uh, it's, a, it's, it's super important for the judges and ourselves. So the judges won't accept any FEA that's done unless it's shown to be mesh independent. And you have to create a new, you have to create a uh, Excel graph that shows max stress against element size, um, that's a, a mesh uh, kind of parameter. And you have to show that it's not dependent on the mesh. So you have to so, show that at some element size, the uh, max stress no longer changes with the uh, change in mesh, okay? So what I recommend is to do at least mesh refinement and at each step, refine the mesh by 1.5 times. So just say if you have 100,000 nodes in your mesh at one stage, and you want to do a mesh refinement study, then you go to 150,000 nodes uh, and do another uh, FEA study, get out the max stress, plot it here, uh, and then do the same thing one more time. And you keep doing this until you get three uh, meshes that you've done an FEA on that give you the same max stress value, okay? This is when your solution is considered mesh independent and the solution no longer depends on the mesh, okay? Now you can get into more exact uh, mesh independent studies using Richardson extrapolations, which I have down here, uh, but you can look that up in your own time if you're interested. But uh, this is the most important thing that I want you guys to get out of today. And it's not sufficient to just do three analyses and then that's it, I'm going to call it uh, my mesh independence study, I'm done. You have to make sure that you've done three analyses and the result has not changed. So if you do three analyses and your max stress is changing from 250 megapascals to 50 megapascals to 240 megapascals, no, you have to keep going. You have to keep refining the mesh to make sure that it's mesh independent, okay? Uh, and this is just an example of this here. So on the left-hand side, you can see two different meshes which we have. And one will give us a max stress of 348 megapascals, the other one 510 megapascals. So the mesh, it, this solution isn't mesh independent is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you cannot trust the results of it at all until it is mesh independent. Um, now, th this is the problem that a lot of students encounter that they run this with one mesh, get out 348 megapascals and say, right, that's my FEA done. Uh, this is the max stress in this part, and then they move on to their next part. But in reality, the uh, stress on the part is quite a lot higher than that. 
a uh, almost 150 megapascals higher than what they think it's going to be. So it's so, so important to make sure that the result is mesh independent. And here's three studies done here, each with a uh, increasing mesh density, but you can see that the result doesn't converge on some values. So we go from 128 or 124 megapascals to 220 to 337. It hasn't leveled out to some max stress value. So we have to keep going. We can't stop here because uh, we can actually look at this and we can say the actual value, which this is meant to be, and this is just known because of a paper that was done, uh, was 427 megapascals in this case. So none of these meshes are actually sufficient to capture our uh, result here, okay? Uh, and this is just one more example. So we have a mesh which has a mesh size or element size of four millimeters versus an element size of three millimeters. And it can. this is just to show that it can also go the other way. So when you refine your mesh, the max stress can go up, but it can also go down. So uh, on refinement here, the max stress went from uh, 1,700 megapascals to 800 megapascals. So it also can go the other way. And this is why you can't say, oh, I'm giving a conservative estimate by doing this or giving um, like too high of an estimate by doing this. You, you have to do your mesh independent study. There's no way around it, okay? So I have some tips here uh, for when you're doing FEA. Um, I'm not gonna run through these, Really, the main thing is just to do your mesh independent study. Typically, when you refine your mesh, your uh, mesh quality metrics will actually become slightly more unimportant because if you have numerical errors due to your mesh uh, in your first simulation, typically when you refine your mesh, those will be gone or to a lesser extent. Okay, so just do your mesh independent study. And if that's not working, then go to the other things which I've mentioned. Okay. Um, and this is just another general tip. Um, and don't, don't be confused by this. So the general area, which this recommends here, four to six elements around a circle or one element for a large fillet. Now this is a general area for larger finite element analyses. So this would be like if you're studying a bridge, right? Um, so if you're studying a bridge, you want four elements around some small hole over in the corner. Um, or one element across the large fillet. In formless students, um, our models are typically small enough that everything is considered a critical area. So these you kind of want to live by over here on the left-hand side, a minimum of 12 elements around a hole and a minimum of three elements around a fillet, okay? But that's, again, just some hand waviness uh, rule of thumb, okay? Uh, and another point uh, that I've seen people try to do before, um, don't, model threads. So a lot of the times we have to model bolts and how they work with our parts, but don't model the threads of these bolts, okay? Your manufacturer will give you some max tension that this bolt can uh, withstand. That's gonna be more reliable than your FEA because you're gonna to have to go so, so dense to actually capture these threads over here. So just model it as a straight bolt and call your day is done, okay? Don't worry about the threads. Um, and as well as that, sometimes we can encounter uh, stress uh, discontinuities or stress uh, where the stress goes to infinity, essentially. So this uh, example here on the left hand side is of a perfectly 90 degree corner. Now, obviously, this doesn't really exist in the real, real world. This only exists in the computer. You can't really have a perfect 90 degree corner. And that, that's why when we're transferring stress across this 90 degree bend, it's going to give us an infinite amount of stress on that on the inside of that corner. Um, now, you can get around this by using a fillet on this corner, but sometimes um, these stress discontinuities are unavoidable in some parts. And when they are unavoidable, what we have to do is just give a bit of extra refinement around them and then ignore them, okay? So we have to realize that they're there, but accept that the result is going to be acceptable at some distance away from them. So the result isn't acceptable because it's obviously infinite at that point, but away from them, the result will be relatively acceptable, okay? And this makes it a bit, bit harder to do a mesh independent study as well. Um, and just to give you an understanding of why the stress goes to infinity here, um, or why uh, it would go to infinity if you do certain things, uh, if we apply a force uh, as a boundary condition to one singular node, uh, 
we're essentially applying a force to a point which has a, an infinite decimal area. So it has zero area. This is going to cause a, an infinite pressure. Okay. So we can't have this and we can't apply this. Uh, and that's just another thing to avoid. Now, this is just a summary of the entire meshing section. So uh, over here on the left hand side, we have a blocky uh, kind of geometry. Recommend hex mesh for this part. On the right hand side, we have a more curvy geometry. Recommend tet mesh. Uh, so that's really what I wanted you to get out of this mesh section. Choice between hex and tet mesh, and then your mesh independent study. Okay. And also, just as a note for areas like chassis, uh, or if there's any civil engineers in here, um, you can also have elements that aren't 3D elements, but they're actually lower dimensional elements. So you can have a 2D element, which is also called a shell, or a 1D element, which is called a beam or bar element. And these are used to uh, model something like, for instance, a sheet metal roof, um, where the thickness of the sheet metal is actually uh, negligible compared to the overall surface area of the sheet metal. So we kind of just want to ignore it. Otherwise, we're going to create a million elements across this thing that we don't want. So we can kind of just ignore it, use a 2D sheet, and then empirically assign some thickness to the uh, sheet metal in ANSYS. And it's the same for a 1D bar element. So if you're looking at a suspension bridge and you have uh, your suspension strings, I don't know what you call them, civil, but yeah, those things. Uh, you can model them as a 1D bar elements, essentially. Uh, where we use this in uh, Formula Student uh, is in one particular place, and that's the chassis. Uh, we use 1D bar elements because, as you can see in the right-hand side there, the chassis is uh, made up of a load of different links, uh, which are can be modeled as one-dimensional. Down there in the bottom right-hand corner is actually the UL, or University of Limerick Formula Student chassis from 2012. Uh, they're back for this year. Uh, so giving us a bit of competition, which is nice. Um, maybe a few of them are here. If they are, good luck, lads. Um, but yeah, also as a note for chassis, while you're here, uh, applying a static load on the front of the car uh, and doing an FEA analysis isn't a crash test, uh, but we'll, we'll get to dynamic FEA later, okay? And this is just an aside because I find this uh, interesting. Um, if anyone here knows me, they'll know I'm a bit of a rocket nerd, but uh, the actual uh, structure of the inside of a rocket barrel is entirely dependent on FEA. So back in the 90s, when uh, 2D TETs were really the most efficient thing that computers could solve, the inside of a rocket barrel was actually what's called an isogrid. So it was these triangular shapes. And that was purely because that's what the FEA could solve. But nowadays, uh, we can solve these hexahedral elements much better and it was actually found that these hex elements are more efficient reinforcement. So the rocket industry has kind of switched over to these elements because they're more um, efficient. And that's entirely because the FEA technology has developed over the years. Okay, so let's move on to some boundary conditions. So uh, the boundary conditions, and this is just a mathematical kind of hand wavy slide again, um, Boundary conditions are constraints which are necessary to solve a boundary value problem. Uh, we are solving a boundary, boundary layer problem here. Uh, it's just a numerical boundary la layer problem. Okay, So we have to give the system some definitive, definitive values or values which we know so that it can start the entire process of solving. Okay, And there's two typical types of boundary conditions which we can give to the system. And these are called Dirichlet. Um, I just butchered that pronunciation, but there you go. Uh, and Neumann, okay? So Dirichlet is essentially just assigning a value, a static value to that boundary. Um, and this would be something like a fixed temperature or a fixed displacement for that boundary. And then a Neumann condition is typically for where the derivative of some function is known at the boundary. So this is if you're applying a heat flux or a stress at a boundary, okay? Uh, and over here on the top right hand side, this is an image which you saw earlier, but boundary conditions in FEA give the known values of F or U that start the process of solving this entire system. Okay, so we can apply boundary conditions to this force, applied force column matrix or this displacement matrix. And typically we'll call these force boundary conditions or displacement boundary conditions. Quite simple. Okay. So um, just to go over that in a bit. Uh, more 
of a slide, really. Um, so our force boundary conditions is a boundary for F. Supports or displacements are a boundary for U. Accelerations are a boundary for F. Contact is a boundary. It's weird. It alters the stiffness matrix. Uh, we'll get to it later. Then symmetry is a boundary condition for the displacement. It just allows no translation across the symmetry plane. Okay. And then we can also have interactions with env the environment, which change depending on the interaction. Okay, so uh, the boundary conditions are really, really important in FEA. Uh, where the most important thing in the mesh was your mesh independent study, the most important thing in finite element analysis is your boundary conditions. Okay, typically the rule of thumb, which you'll see floating around in FEA circles, is that the importance, the accuracy of your results is weighted 70% boundary conditions, 30% mesh, okay? So your boundary conditions really do um, influence the accuracy and the solution which you're gonna get out. So you have to get them right. Um, okay. So uh, I don't want to go there just yet. So when you're applying boundary conditions, make sure that um, you know your free body diagram. That is the most important thing when it comes to uh, applying boundary conditions. If you apply your boundary conditions wrong, there is no amount of perfect meshing that's going to give you a correct answer. Okay, you have to make sure that your boundary conditions are correct. Now, uh, we can apply boundary conditions to the degrees of freedom. So this is our displacement boundary conditions. Okay, so the first boundary condition that almost everyone will go for. Um, and anyone that's tried FEA has probably gone for this one, is the fixed support, okay? I call it the beginner's go-to. Um, essentially what it does it, it is it applies zero displacement in every single direction. So zero displacement on X, Y, and Z to every node on a face, okay? Now, this can seem nice, but actually it can cause a lot of problems. So if you imagine this down here on the right, on the left-hand side, sorry, um, if we apply a fixed support boundary condition at the bottom here, and then we pull this bar up, we've given every single node here on the bottom face a displacement of zero in every single direction. It can't move at all. But because of the Poisson effect, when we pull this thing up, it's going to reduce a tiny bit in cross section. Okay, But our elements or our nodes that are on the very edges of this are fixed to be in that position. So it has to bow out here at the end. And this can cause stress concentrations near the bottom of this um, kind of beam, which is intention. But it's not just limited to being this intention, obviously. Um, this can happen in a multitude of different scenarios. So when you're applying your support boundary conditions, really think about the degrees of freedom which you're trying to restrict. Uh, and this is just a note on constraining a system. So if we have a L bracket, which is up against a wall here, and we have a bolt which goes through it, and this bolt is the only thing that's holding the system down. Um, what boundary conditions do we apply here? So we can apply just the bolt boundary condition um, and see what that does. And also there's a force here on this, on the end of this cell bracket. We can apply just the force on the top hole as a fixed condition, but this isn't gonna give us the result that we want, right? So this, this L bracket is gonna deform into the wall, which is what we call under constrained you're not considering the wall and the solution is not accurate, okay? Support on the back of this bracket to act as the wall. That's something that we can do. But now this also produces what's called an over-constrained model. These results are also wrong because what actually would happen is this would bow out slightly and come away from the wall a tiny bit. And that can't happen if we have a fixed support. Uh, so a better method to constrain this would be to apply some uh, fixed condition down here at the very bottom that allows for some amount of rotation, okay? Now, this isn't the perfect way of doing it. The perfect way of doing this would be contact, which we'll get to later, but uh, this is just to keep it linear, um, to keep the solution linear, okay? Uh, but really, what I'm trying to say with the, all of this is fixed supports are not your friend. Um, I typically recommend against them completely. Uh, if you want to apply a support or a displacement condition that restricts the movement of every single degree of freedom, I recommend using a displacement uh, boundary condition and manually restricting every single degree of freedom. 
just so that you have to think about every single degree of freedom before you can. Okay. So now we get onto a more uh, general type of fixed support, which is called the displacement support. So you can apply zero displacement in some general direction. So you can, uh, this is a choice between X, Y, Z or rotation in any of those three directions, okay? Um, entering zero here will mean that it's constrained in that direction. So if we constrain it in just the X direction, it means that it can't move in the X direction, but it can move in every single other direction. Um, and there's a few different variations of this. So a remote displacement can be a displacement that's centered around some point outside of the body. Um, so this would generate a coupled moment. Uh, th this, this is a bit more uh, of the advanced side of things. Uh, but typically, if you're trying to model, say, a suspension clevis, uh, but you're not trying to model the clevis itself, this might be a way of doing that. Um, and then a frictionless support just means that it has no movement in the normal or radial directions, but it can rotate around that support. So if we applied a frictionless support here on this bolt hole, then the entire part could rotate around it, but it couldn't move into it or out of it, essentially. It's essentially like modeling a bolt within some cylindrical face, okay? And frictionless support and cylindrical support are quite similar. Uh, if you're applying them and you're get, running into trouble, do look up the differences between the two, but I won't go through them. Uh, and then compression only support is one that you'll see. Uh, and this is actually a useful one. So down here on the right hand side, you can see that we've applied a compression only support to the inside bolt hole of this face. Uh, and what it does is if you consider that this part here is being pulled upwards, if we apply displacement support or a fixed condition to this uh, bolt hole, it's also going to fix the top of this uh, bolt hole. But if we pull it up and there's a bolt in there, the top of this hole isn't gonna constrain it at all. The top of the hole is actually free to move. It's only the bottom of the hole, which is actually touching the bolt face. So that's what a compression only support tries to um, emulate. But the important thing is that it's a non-linear support type and we'll get into non-linear later, um, but uh, it adds an extra layer of complexity, but it's a more accurate way of uh, modeling bolt holes, okay? So now we get on to loads, and these are the other more general type of uh, conditions. So we went through displacement conditions, and then we have the uh, conditions which uh, provide a boundary for the F column matrix. Um, so the most basic one is obviously a force. Uh, again, so there's a bit of nuance to this. Uh, this will apply the force to every single node which you have on that face. So it's important that you recognize the entire face which you apply this force to is going to have that force on it. So if you have a plate and you have a bolt that's just touching that plate, touching against that plate, and you don't want to model the bolt, you just want to model the force that it applies to the plate, you don't want to apply the entire force to the entire face of the plate because that's going to press that force into every single area of the plate, not just where the bolt, bolt is touching. So you want to make sure that you have a face which you can apply the force to that is where that bolt is touching. Uh, and we'll go through again that again a bit later. I have a few pictures of that just to solidify it. Okay, so a remote, a remote force is a bit like a remote displacement as well. Uh, this is a force that takes place outside of the geometry, so it will generate a coupled moment as well. So if you can imagine a, a suspension upright where all of the forces that go through a suspension upright come from the contact patch uh, we can apply the force at the contact patch, which is outside of the suspension upright geometry, but it will generate the coupled moment that goes along with that uh, and the torque that goes along with um, creating that force outside of the uh, geometry. Okay, So it allows us to uh, get rid of some parts of the geometry uh, and model just what we want to model. Then there's also acceler acceleration, gravity, pressure, hydrostatic pressure and moments, which are all different boundary conditions, but we don't use them too often. Uh, a bearing load also is the load equivalent of a compression support. So it'll only apply to one side of a face. Um, uh, I went through the compression support earlier, so I don't think I should need to go through this in too much detail, but it's applying only to one side of say a bolt hole. And there's a picture of it there in the middle left-hand side. Okay. so. 
uh, this is just a note on materials. Um, you have to apply your material to your uh, analysis. You have to apply your material properties, and this will be things like Poisson ratio and your uh, elastic modulus. So that you'll get that from your strain curve. Those are typically the things that you need to apply for your material. There's not much else that you need to apply because those are the only things that really um, determine a, a FEA study. But also, I, I just want to make one point. Uh, the material data for carbon fiber is in ANSYS. So ANSYS has a material library where they have a bunch of default materials and carbon fiber is in there, but uh, it's not actually carbon fiber. It's meant to be used in a different program called ACP pre-post, um, which is a module in ANSYS that's separate to static structural. Um, but carbon fiber is non-isotropic, it's orthotropic, okay? And FEA, what we've talked about so far is purely isotropic. So if you use carbon fiber for this isotropic FEA, which we've spoken about, it's gonna be completely wrong, but it also won't tell you that it's completely wrong. So don't use carbon fiber unless you know how to set up an orthotrophic material in ACP, okay? Now, uh, we can move away from modeling simple systems which just have one geometry in them to a global system of geometries. So uh, your first analysis might be, so this is a suspension upright here on the left-hand side, uh, this gray part here. Your first analysis of a suspension upright might just be the upright itself um, with all the forces going into it applied as boundary conditions, okay? But that's what we call an isolated model. And it's very good for your first analysis, but it's not the most accurate thing that you can do. If you do a global model or you create a global model, it's gonna be more accurate and uh, it's gonna uh, simulate the stress distribution throughout the entire thing much more accurately at the expense of computational complex complexity and cost, okay? Um, so the workflow in Formula Student is Firstly, doing your isolated model of just your singular part, and then going to your global model where more than one part is considered within your analysis, okay? And here's a global model analysis of an entire suspension system over here. Uh, yeah, so this is just a um, kind of brief note on the workflow in ANSYS. Um, if you're just starting to use ANSYS, I recommend looking at this. Uh, I won't talk about it. I'll let you screen grab it or anything. Uh, or pause the video if you're looking at it later. Uh, but now we're getting to post-processing. So we've done the entire setup, okay, uh, of a standard linear uh, analysis in FEA. But how do we actually visualize the results and how do we kind of interpret the results? So we have some standard post-processing metrics. And the most standard one is the deformation. So this is a direct output from the uh, system that we're trying to solve, the uh, displacements of the different pieces of this. Um, so we can output the total deformation or the total displacement of the part, and that will tell us, say, in millimeters, how much the part has deflected um, because of the loads that we've applied. But we can also consider a directional displacement, which is if we just consider one direction, like how much the part has dis displaced just in the x direction, it can tell us that. Okay, but now we can move on to stress. Stress is a bit more uh, complicated because it's not as easy as it seems in your first two years of college. Um, stress isn't just a scalar number. It's not even just a vector. It's what's called a tensor. So what I'm showing here in the top left-hand corner is the Cauchy stress tensor, also known as the total stress tensor. And it consists of nine stress components or if you actually want to get into the detail, it contains six stress components because it's a symmetrical tensor, but um, that's neither here nor there. But it consists of three normal stress components and three shear stress components, which are symmetrical, okay? There's too much stress in it from these six components of stress. We don't want to look at six components individually and kind of guess at whether the part has yielded or not. We want to get an exact number out. So we have what's called the von Mises criterion for stress. And it's essentially, um, the von Mises criterion for stress essentially will give us one number out. You can imagine it as the magnitude. It's not really, but you can imagine it as that, the magnitude of the stress tensor. 
um, which will tell us, uh, it's a criterion that essentially tells us if the von, Mie von Mises stress is over the yield stress of the material, the material has yielded. Okay, so typically we'll take yielding as failing for a part. It hasn't necessarily broken, it's just yielded and lost all of its structural integrity. Um, but if it's gone past the yield stress of von Mises criterion, that means that the part has yielded. Okay, that's just what the von Mises criterion tells us. There's also other criterions like the Tresker criterion, um, but we won't get into them. The most standard one is the von Mises criterion. Um, and it's also important to note that although if the stress is beyond the yield stress or if the von Mises stress is beyond the yield stress, the part has yielded, the FEA program or the FEM isn't going to necessarily tell us that explicitly, okay? We're not gonna know it uh, just by looking at the FEA because the FEA assumes a linear correlation to infinity of the relationship between stress and strain, okay? So it's only accurate in this uh, linear version of our stress strain graph. Past that, our linear FEA is worth nothing, okay? If we go past the yield point, our numbers are completely false and the part has failed. There are methods of going into the plastic region of this curve, and we'll even touch on them later. But uh, for the moment, if it goes past the yield stress, your part has failed and the FEA has told you that it's failed and your stress distribution is completely false from then on. But it will tell you exactly where it failed. Okay, so um, yeah, here I'll just go back over the von Mises stress. So uh, it's the most uh, standard one that outputs from ANSYS and it will give you a singular number instead of some six component uh, tensor, which you don't want to really look at. Uh, but there's a bunch of other things which you can look at as well. Uh, Von Mises is uh, typically used for ductile materials, so that includes metals. But if you have a brittle material like some kind of uh, ceramic, you actually want to look at the maximum normal stress, um, not the uh, Von Mises stress. So then we also have a stress tool which can uh, give us some more indications of exactly what's going on with the stress. And we can look at the individual components of the Cauchy stress tensor to understand whether bending or shearing or axial tension is occurring. Uh, but unless you really want to understand that, uh, I'm not going to touch on it. And then this is typically one of the ones, one of the post-processing metrics that I find the most useful and it's structural error. Um, and it has nothing to do with actual real life results. Um, what it tells you is the difference in stress between two neighboring elements. Um, so the stress when it moves through a part is going to have some stress gradient. So it's a continuous function that has some gradient or some slope to it. And you want to make sure that the mesh captures that. If the difference in stress between two neighboring mesh or two neighboring elements is too high, then your mesh isn't capturing that stress gradient. Um, so if your structural error is too high, then your mesh isn't refined enough. So it gives you an indication of where you want to refine your mesh to uh, get more accuracy. So uh, areas of high structural error are where you want to refine your mesh is what I'm trying to say. Then we can get into design assessment, but I'm not gonna to touch on it today. If you want to compare multiple designs within ANSYS, uh, look at these slides later on. Uh, there's also a probe, uh, which is fairly simple in what it does. It probes a singular point to tell you whatever value you want at that particular point. So be that stress, directional de deformation, or just deformation in general, or even strain energy, everything like that. You can get all of that out. And then reaction force as well. So there's gonna be some force that's caused by your supports, uh, be that your fixed support or your displacement support. If you wanna get that value out, you can check your reaction force. It can also help uh, gauge whether your uh, result is accurate or not, whether the, uh, applied forces are equal to the forces that come from your uh, uh, displacement conditions, your supports. So essentially the system is in equilibrium. So um, this kind of ties in with your mesh independent study. Um, there's a thing in all simulation called validation and verification, okay? Uh, and these two things, validation and verification are distinctly different. They might sound the same, they might be synonyms outside of engineering, but they're not the same thing. Validation is, did I solve the model correctly? 
did I solve my numerical model such that the accuracy of the numerical model is good? And then verification is, did I solve the right model? So this is a stupid example, but did I solve a stress analysis for when I actually want to do a thermal analysis? Um, it can be more nuanced than that. There are more modeling things which you can uh, apply, but this also applies to boundary conditions. Did I apply the right boundary conditions to my part? So validation uh, includes things like modeling error with your CAD or um, uh, boundary condition error, or no, sorry, that's ver ver verification. Did I solve the me model correctly is things like uh, your mesh independent study on your CAD, uh, whether your CAD is represented representative of your geometry. And then verification is, did I solve the right model? This is things like um, your boundary condition error, okay? And then at the bottom here, I have a mantra to live by, you could say, uh, and that's, if you can't draw your free body diagram, you can't verify that your results are accurate, don't touch FEA yet. So you must be able to draw your boundary or your free body diagram before touching FEA so that you can apply your boundary conditions correctly. But if you do apply everything correctly, FEA can be a really, really useful tool. So you can see here that this car crash is simulated almost perfectly by the FEA simulation. The more that you look at it, the more it's actually surprising how well this did. This exact cut here in this part, perfectly represented. This little bar here that's deformed, perfectly represented in here. Even the tire looks similar to what's actually going on here. This bottom part here, exactly captured in FEA. If you do your FEA correctly, correctly and you do validation and verification, FEA can actually stand up in a court of law. It's that accurate, okay? But you have to do it correctly, is what I'm trying to say. So how do we do design verification? The first checks, which you usually want to do, is check your reaction forces. So uh, you have you've applied some forces to the system, uh, and this will give you some stresses and deformations. But you'll also check the reaction forces, and you'll compare these with the applied forces which you put into the system, and whether um, the system is in equilibrium, essentially. And then the next thing that you want to do is look at your deformations, and do they make sense? So. For instance, if you have this connecting rod here, if your deformation is something like six meters for the deformation at the top, it's wrong. I think that goes without saying. And then, sorry, uh, do the mesh refinement. So do your mesh independent study um, and make sure that it's met, the solution is mesh independent, okay? So those are your first checks. Then your final checks, which you have to do, um, are hand calculations. So uh, for this example of the connecting rod, um, it's not perfectly represented by anything that you can do a hand calculation on. It's FEA of a complex geometry. There's, no, there's gonna be no analytical solution to this, but you can approximate this as an I-beam essentially. And this will just give you a range of values which you can kind of understand whether it's accurate or not. So if you're, you can, you can assume that this is an I-beam of constant width here and do your hand calculation for it. And if your stress that you've calculated by hand is 10 times less than the stress that you get out for FEA, you can immediately start to recognize that something's wrong. But that's how you use hand calculations to kind of verify if your result is accurate to real life. Experimentation is the best form of validation, but it's also hard to come across. So um, if you can do it, perfect, but it's not always an option, okay? Um, and then you can also do a one part away model. This is halfway to a global model, really. Um, but you can include more geometries within the model to uh, place a greater distance between the boundary conditions and the actual part which you're interested in. And then the last thing that you can do is bring your analysis to someone more familiar with FEA. If you're part of Formula Trinity, you can bring it to me or Killian or David and we'll take a look at it and tell you if it looks okay. Um, and hopefully at some stage, you'll be in the position where you're checking other people's FEA. Okay, Sherlock, um, 
so, some things are important. <laughs> so I have fatigue here as an option. Uh, we, came, we went to the competition one year without having done fatigue studies and the judges roasted us. So this is an important topic. And one that David, last time I gave this talk, explicitly asked me to include. Uh, so I have it here. Um, what is fatigue? So fatigue is when a part fails uh, before it's predicted um, yield stress. So this is when you apply a cyclic load or some periodic load and the part fails before you expect it to fail, okay? Um, this is typically more difficult to do in FEA, so we kind of use empirical models to simulate it. And there's two main methods of doing this, strain life and stress life. Yes, David, that is also you. Um, so I have kind of workflows here for strain life and stress life, but to be honest, Fatigue is quite simple in the way that it works. And there's only a few things that you need to understand. If you want to get into the actual, like exact nitty gritty of what's going on, the actual things behind it, you can look at these slides. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but yeah, uh, your fatigue analysis is going to be a big part of forming a student. You'll only have to change a few parameters. So I'm not going to go through it too much. Uh, the main two types of fatigue analysis are strain life and stress life, like I said before. Um, we'll mainly be using stress life because it's used for high cycle fatigue or um, where the part is being unloaded and reloaded quite a lot of times. So this is when parts um, are subjected to fatigue over a long time. They have a longer lifespan. And typically low cycle fatigue. If anyone does a course in fatigue as part of their mechanical engineering degree, low cycle fatigue is um, when the applied load is typically beyond the yield stress. So you're actually going into the plastic region uh, a bit each time. Okay, so we can get into load types. Uh, this just depends on your model. So you can apply a sinusoidal load. It can be zero based, it can reverse, uh, all of that kind of thing. Um, I have the options here laid out. Uh, so read it if you're doing a fatigue study, but typically it's fairly simple to understand uh, what type of cyclic load you're looking at. So um, I won't talk about this too much. And then this is just an uh, even more loot point. Uh, and also uh, you have to choose a fatigue theory when you're doing a fatigue analysis. Uh, there is different reasons to choose different material or different fatigue theories. theories. Uh, Goodman, Gerber and Soderberg are the main ones offered by ANSYS. Um, and they just tell you how the um, strength of the part varies with its time undergoing fatigue, really. Um, I recommend using Goodman for almost everything. I have Goodman set down to brittle here, uh, but really Goodman extends beyond that. Uh, you can read into it a bit more if you want to, but uh, it's a fatigue failure theory that you'll go into if you do um, any third year course in materials. And then there is also post-processing metrics that come with fatigue. Um, these are fairly simple as well. You'll get things like fatigue safety factor. Um, I would say that most people in engineering understand what the safety factor is. So this will just tell you exactly what your safety factor is after it's applied this fatigue. Um, fatigue life will tell you exactly how many cycles it can undergo before it fails. Um, and fatigue sensitivity tells you how much, how sensitive one area of your geometry is to uh, fatiguing. Okay, And then biaxiality indication is a bit more uh, weird. We don't really need it. Okay, so uh, to conduct a fatigue analysis, um, I, I have um, a, a setup kind of here, but really all that you need to do is add the fatigue tool into your post-processing and then add things like life and damage and factor of safety, and it will tell you automatically. So I won't get into it too much uh, because it is just uh, kind of button pressing. Okay, now we get to a bit more of an interesting topic and a topic that maybe Formula, Formula Trinity maybe kind of specializes in. So topology optimization is um, taking the results of a static structural analysis and optimizing for those specific boundary conditions. So we can apply force boundary conditions and displacement boundary conditions and simulate the stress moving through a part. But uh, in the past, we had to a model a blocky geometry and then kind of guess uh, based on uh, best engineering practices where to take out material from this uh, blocky model. And um, 
nowadays or in more uh, advanced computational areas, the computer can automatically generate a structure that is perfect for those applied loads. This is called topology optimization. Um, and I won't get into the actual workings of topology optimization because that's an entire PhD subject. Um, but in essence, it produces lovely, lovely results that you can see down here in the bottom right hand corner that look almost um, like they ev evolved in some kind of organism, right? So that's, uh, you can see it in the middle here. That's the topology optimized part. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a bit of a case study with topology optimization just to show you exactly how uh, topology optimization is done. And this is the exact uh, process which we go through in Formula Trinity as well. Um, so this is a case study from the NTNU Tron Time uprights. Uh, so this is a sp suspension upright like I've spoken about earlier. So uh, just to give you an uh, understanding of how this topology optimization helped NTNU, uh, the mass was reduced from on the order of about two kilograms down to um, just over half a kilogram for both uprights, both front and rear uprights, uh, while maintaining a, a tenth of a millimeter in deflection, in maximum deflection. Uh, these were, uh, so obviously these can't be CNC or uh, manufactured in any uh, old manufacturing process. Uh, so these ones in particular are 3D printed titanium. And the topology optimization itself took um, on the order of one to two days to actually run. So the simulation does take a while to do, but it produces nice results. So the first thing that we do is we uh, define a design domain. And this is, is exactly where we can optimize. So this part is called a blank, right? It's just a blocky geometry that defines everywhere where a material could possibly be. And the way that topology optimization works is that it cuts things out of this block, okay? It doesn't grow anything. That would be a different topic called generative design. It cuts things away. Then we discretize this domain uh, with a mesh and uh, opposed to typical finite elements analysis where your mesh has to be dense around areas of high stress. Uh, for topology optimization, your mesh has to be dense almost everywhere. So it, really, it leads to um, high mesh uh, density. Uh, this one from Tron Time did have 8 million nodes in total, which is a ridiculous amount and probably why it took one to two days, but also produced fantastic results. Yeah, and you can see just the uh, fineness of the mesh in there as well. And also note that they've used hexahedral cells, which I've mentioned before are more efficient in the way that you, they solve. Um, so they, they are doing this in the most efficient manner possible. And then they define the boundary conditions for this setup. So they set up the interactions with its environment. Uh, and this includes the A-arms, the suspension A-arms, which come in and the boundary conditions that come from the uh, center borehole of this uh, suspension upright. Yeah, there's the applied boundary conditions there, the uh, displacement boundary conditions in the center and the uh, load boundary conditions at the top. Or actually no, it's the opposite way around, load in here and displacement over here. And then, the program automatically solves the FEA first. That's the first thing it does. It solves the FEA for the blank, the entire blank. And then what it does is it cuts down iteratively um, areas which are not of high importance and it produces this meshy looking uh, structure here, which we then smooth out uh, to create the part. So here's the smooth version of those two. Um, I don't know about anyone that's here, but personally, I think these look beautiful. Um, so, uh, and they're also the most optimal um, structures for the applied loads, which they're uh, experiencing. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Like with mesh independent study and validation and verification, you also have to validate that your topology optimization is good. Um, so you have to put them back into FEA and make sure that there wasn't any uh, hiccups along the topology optimization road and that uh, they actually do withstand these loads which you're trying to subject them to. Um, so once your optimization is done, this, this step is required. And if you go to the competition with a topology optimized part, but you haven't validated it's able to withstand the stresses which it undergoes, you're going to get immediately laughed out of the design session and probably not allowed to race if it's a, a key component.
And these, this is just a few pictures of those uh, uprights. You can see them there. Um, yeah, this is a, a video which I have. I'm uh, not going to go through it too much, but uh, this is the topology optimization process and the 3D printing process as well. So I'll skip through it a tiny bit. 3D printing titanium. Uh, the video failed. Nice. All right, let's keep going. Uh, and I said before that Formula Trinity almost specializes in this area, and that's because we have support from uh, one of our new sponsors, Topology. And topology optimization in a slightly different way. They use what's called implicit modeling. So where typical CAD geometries are parametrically defined by some kind of surface mesh, uh, N Topology has a really unique way of doing it where all of their CAD is uh, what's called implicit modeled. So the equations that actually govern the CAD and the shape of the CAD are kept within the software. And that allows you to do analytical things with this CAD, uh, like Boolean subtracts and Boolean unions. Um, and it also makes it really easy to do topology optimization. Okay, so now we're getting to nonlinear analysis, which is something that I didn't talk about the last time I gave this talk. And um, so hopefully this will be interesting. Uh, so what is nonlinearity? So obviously, uh, if we're doing an engineering course, we understand what nonlinearity is. Uh, it's when, if you imagine a graph and it's linear in some region, the uh, rate of change of some value with respect to another is constant. Um, nonlinearity is not that, essentially. So the line is not straight, if you're thinking about that graph. Um, so it's required whenever the stiffness matrix, which if you remember is K, changes with the solution. Um, and there's three main forms of nonlinearity. There's geometric, material, and boundary condition nonlinearity. Geometric nonlinearity is when it deforms in some way that the applied loads actually change. So you can think of this as, um, actually, I'll get to it in the next slide. Um, so then material nonlinearity is when, it's probably the most intuitive of them all. It's when the material follows a nonlinear stress-strain relationship. And this could be a hyperelastic material like rubbers, which follow a nonlinear curve, or it could be a metal that's beyond its yield point and you want to simulate it up to its ultimate tensile strength, for instance. Uh, and then we have boundary, boundary or contact nonlinearity. Um, and this is when contact produces a change in the stiffness matrix that we need to account for. Um, and this is probably one of the main ones that we're going to be looking at in Formula Student because a lot of things are in contact with each other, obviously. So, What's the fuss with nonlinearity? Why is it? Why have I separated it out? Um, so, a numerical method can't perfectly simulate a nonlinear function. That's just how the world is. What it does instead is it simulates it with a series of linear approximations. So, you can see down here on the bottom right hand corner a series of linear approximations which approximate this nonlinear curve here. Um, and one uh, the, the main problem with this is that this black line, which you see here, this nonlinear curve, isn't known beforehand. Uh, so we don't know beforehand typically, unless it's something like a material nonlinearity, which we define before. Uh, and typically, the way that we do this is with something like the Newton Raphson method, uh, which I give a bit of an explanation down here, but I don't want to go into it too much. But essentially, it takes a few iterations to get to this point. So when we were talking about linear FEA before, it solved the system once um, and once only. When we get into iterations, it has to solve it multiple times. So every, every time that you see this curve here, the system is solving again to get closer and closer to the result. Um, and this is, what, uh, this is why nonlinear simulations take so much longer than linear simulations. OK, so nonlinear simulations are also not guaranteed to converge. So with linear simulations, we're almost always guaranteed to converge to some extent. We're, convert, we're guaranteed to get some value out at the end of it, whether that value is right or not is a different scenario. Um, but with nonlinear simula simulations, we might not even get a result out at the end of it because uh, the linear approximation of this curve might just go off into infinity and not actually find the curve. So it will only converge if it's within what's called a radius of convergence. Uh, and that's easier to understand if you go back and read the uh, Newton-Raphson method. Uh, and I'll leave that to do it yourself, really. 
Um, so to overcome this issue, we have to apply the load incrementally. So this is one of the most important things with nonlinear analysis. Um, if we start off, if we want to apply a load of five kilonewtons, what we should do is we should set up a time simulation that goes from zero seconds to one second and start at zero seconds with zero newtons of applied load and then interpolate that linearly to apply five kilonewtons at one second. Okay, so applying that incrementally over some uh, amount of time. So it goes from zero to five over some amount of time. Um, and this can uh, allow the uh, solution to start within the radius of convergence a bit more easily. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just one difference that we need to account for. Um, so a tip is to keep an eye on the analysis settings and solver log uh, and parental advisory is recommended. So uh, again, come to me, Killian or David, um, if you're trying to do a nonlinear simulation. Uh, and then some general tips for it. Uh, obviously, like I mentioned before, apply your loads in increments um, and then enable auto time stepping. So this will uh, separate the time between zero and one seconds into smaller chunks. Nonlinear effects, the smaller that time step is going to get. Um, and the program can vary this automatically. Um, but it can lead to longer solve times. Uh, but that's just the nature of nonlinear or nonlinear simulation. Then bisection is just something to look out for. And you can see it in this graph on the right-hand side. It's when the linear approximation completely misses the uh, nonlinear curve. And the solution goes back to the previous time step, and, uh, applies the load at a smaller time step to try and uh, capture those nonlinear effects. It isn't a, it isn't a dead end. Like it, the, the program can still go on after that, but it's a bit of a, uh, indication that the program is running into some difficulty. Okay, so also direct solver is more robust, will take longer, uh, but typically we recommend an iterative solver, which is more, more efficient and recommended, but that's also de the default. Um, so don't worry about that really. The main thing that you want to look out for in nonlinear simulation, or the main thing you want to watch is the convergence graph. And you want to make sure that this is actually converging and it's not just going off into infinity and not actually getting anything out. Um, so you want to keep an eye on this and making sure that the simulation is progressing over time. So uh, what about geometric nonlinearity? So this is an important thing to understand, really. And I'll talk about it just through this picture here on the right. So uh, if we take this geometry here and we apply two loads uh, over a certain amount of time, so imagine we apply these loads uh, both with zero newtons at zero seconds and then vary them up to 200 newtons and one newton at one second. So this will start out at zero seconds as zero newtons and then uh, linearly ramp up to 200 newtons. And the same with this one, this will start out at zero and go up to one. If we do a linear simulation, a linear simulation doesn't take into account the deformation that this thing experiences through this time step. So it will always assume that this system has no displacement. Um, that the displacement is the same as when it started. But a nonlinear simulation takes into account the changing geometry. Um, so we can see that there's a massive difference between the linear and nonlinear simulation. And that's because every single time step which we consider, the loads are reconsidered um, on this nonlinear simulation. So uh, this is kind of a graphical representation of geometric nonlinearity. It's also called large deflections. So if you're uh, planning on encountering any large deflections in your FEA model, or your displacements are going to be large, uh, for instance, uh, you expect a bell crank to rotate because it's compressing a spring, you want large deformations. Or like if the structure is just deforming um, because of the large structure, you want large deformations. Then contact nonlinearity. This one's a bit more confusing, so I won't talk about it as much. Uh, but uh, ideally, in an or in an ideal world, uh, nothing would ever penetrate uh, each other because that's not how really the real world works. Uh, objects don't penetrate each other; they don't overlap each other. Um, but we can't simulate contact contact unless they do in a numerical domain. So the way that we get around this is we apply some kind of contact stiffness. And um, so when the parts overlap, we essentially model a spring in between them that has some very high stiffness that will send it back 
out into the domain and model this contact. Okay, so the two main methods of doing this are the penalty method and the augmented Lagrange method. Um, and those are just two methods of applying this essentially spring load over here. Now, I, the important thing with contact nonlinearity is your contact and target surfaces. So uh, between the contact or, um, sorry, uh, yeah, overlap between the parts in contact is only recognized when the elements of the target surface cross a contact surface node. So this is most easily seen with this graphic over here. Um, but whichever one that you expect to cross first, you want to set as the uh, contact surface. So it, it will only recognize contact when a, a target surface node crosses a contact surface node. So you can see these are two of the same simulation here, but the assignment of contact and target surfaces is different. And uh, it's resulted in a different amount of penetration here. So just be careful with that. And this is a simulation of contact, which you can see down here. Uh, and there's multiple types of contact, and these are all important, but bonded, rough, uh, separation, frictionless, and frictional. Um, these are the most important ones, uh, really, um, or really them. Uh, so frictional is the most uh, all-encompassing type of contact, but it's also the most difficult to solve. So I recommend staying with these ones for as long as possible. Bonded contact is also a linear contact type. Um, it essentially models the contact as completely glued together. They're part of the same part. That's what it does. But uh, if you're doing your first analysis, I recommend bonded contact. And then rough contact will allow for separation, but no sliding. Uh, then uh, frictionless contact will allow for sliding or for um, separation, but uh, sliding, but the coefficient of friction is zero. So it has no friction. Okay, so those are the main forms of contact. And then material nonlinearity. Uh, I just wanted to speak about this briefly because the last time I gave this talk, um, a student came to me with his PhD trying to do this and it was confusing as hell. So uh, I'll give a brief explanation for this. Um, material nonlinearity is for modeling materials that are beyond yield, beyond yield, hyperelastic, or going into hysteresis or some other type of material nonlinearity. Those are the main ones. But uh, it's, it's, it's easiest to understand when you look at a stress strain curve. So this first part of the stress strain curve is initially linear, and then it goes to nonlinear. Um, and that's essentially what material nonlinearity is trying to model. Um, it's not much more than that. And again, I'm mentioning this thing about carbon fiber. Um, even though you see it in the material library, it won't work. Don't use it. Okay, so. Uh, running through an example. Uh, so this is the Monash Motorsport rear bulkhead. Uh, we're doing something similar at Formula Trinity with a rear plate. Um, but I, I want to go through how they exactly uh, did their FEA for this. And this comes from a um, webinar that they did with ANSYS called Designing to Win. Okay. Now, uh, the initial analysis consisted of an entirely linear analysis. Um, that was just looking at a uh, structural deformation, not any kind of contact or material nonlinearity, anything like that. So they modeled bolt holes as fixed supports. Now I told you to be careful with these things, but they forces are applied. Now, one, one important thing to note here, and this is often a mistake that people first doing FEA don't realize, um, the force that's coming from this part here, so this would be the uh, um, differential mount, is only applied through a face which perfectly represents the face which is in contact with the differential mount. You don't apply the force that comes from this on the entire face of the rear bulkhead. You only apply it where it matters, OK? Now, this is just a more uh, simple representation of everything that's going on. Um, so they've also applied frictionless support constraints uh, to constrain longitudinal motion inside these. Uh, these are also linear supports, OK? So uh, we can now compare, or sorry, these are, those were two different types of analysis between fixed support and frictionless support to understand the differences between the two. So 
The frictionless support and the fixed support came out looking relatively similar, uh, but uh, importantly, near the bolt holes is where they looked a bit weird. Um, but typically outside of there, they looked uh, quite similar. So that's really what you can expect with um, these types of things. Uh, and then with these uh, linear analyses, they went from uh, their initial blank, which I've called it before, to a optimized part. So the optimization will take place on the linear analysis, and then your final analysis will be a non-linear analysis, OK? So keep to linear analysis for as long as you can, um, but just make sure that you're doing it in a reasonable way. So now they can go to their refined analysis, and they're going to do what's called a one part away FEA. Uh, and they're modeling uh, essentially one part that is away from the model. So they're modeling more of a global system here. And this has more of a this has a longer solve time, but at the same time, um, it's more accurate. So you can see that there's a lot more parts considered within here. It also introduces contacts and therefore nonlinearity. So the contacts which they uh, model are things like between the diffuse the uh, amount of the uh, differential and the rear plate. Uh, and initially, these are modeled as bonded. Uh, like I always recommend, but down the line, they're modeled as uh, different types of rough and frictionless supports. Okay, so um, remote forces are applied at the um, kind of rod end centers over here. Uh, bearing loads are applied. So bearing loads, like I mentioned before, are nonlinear uh, force types. Uh, and they're applied in here, um, bearing, uh, bushing bearing loads as well. So uh, they did a comparison between a tetrahedral mesh uh, and a, a hexahedral mesh. And the tetrahedral mesh uh, took 53% longer for the same level of accuracy. So when you're getting to do nonlinear analysis, the efficiency of your mesh really is important as well. So try your best to use a hex mesh. Um, they noticed that they had a, a large, stress, large stress concentrations on sharp corners or uh, sharp transitions and a lack of stress around the bolt holes. And lack of stress around the bolt holes can typically be caused by uh, your boundary conditions around these areas. So it's um, something to look out for. But then their final analysis, um, they go through the different types of contact that they went through here, but they modeled rough contact, frictionless contact, rough contact, and frictionless contact. Um, so this would be a fully nonlinear simulation of uh, the rear plate, which they have here. And this is their final most accurate analysis. And typically what we'll be doing for our final most accurate analysis of our um, uh, rear plate. Uh, and then here's just a bit more detail about the exact types of uh, contact. So this is a comparison between their initial analysis, which was uh, a linear analysis, and their final analysis, which is a nonlinear analysis. Um, now you can see the max stress actually reduced uh, this might not be the case for all cases, like I mentioned before, but the important thing is the difference in how it looks and the solve time. So the solve time here is 20 minutes, very short, but the solve time for the final analysis is on the order of 13 hours. Um, but the accuracy of the simulation is much better. Uh, and that can be noticed around things in particular, like the contact regions. So if you look at any region where contact is actually modeled, the accuracy around those regions is going to be much better. So typically, if we look at the areas where there's a bolt, you can see the stress distribution around this bolt here. But if we go back to the initial analysis where it was modeled as a fixed support, you can see that the stress isn't represented almost at all over here. So the final analysis really um, helped with the stress distribution around these areas. And that's the kind of level of accuracy you can expect with uh, these fully global and nonlinear uh, analyses. Okay, so uh, this is the last topic which I have um, before we get on to if anyone has questions. And it's only two slides, so don't worry. Um, what is the difference between a static and dynamic analysis? So a static analysis, like I've mentioned before, an analysis that of the governing equation F is equal to KU, or the force, the applied force is equal to the stiffness matrix times the displacement column vector. Um, now, it's important to note that static analysis can consider time. So this one at the top right-hand side over here is actually a static analysis 
Um, so static analyses can actually consider uh, time-dependent effects. Uh, this is a mathematical representation of static Hooke's law or a system in equilibrium. Uh, so why do we need dynamics if we can stimulate um, this uh, system that changes with time over here? Well, we need dynamics to simulate two things, inertia and damping. So uh, our governing equation changes. So it changes uh, to be a uh, force is a function of time. All of these are now a function of time. So the applied force is now time dependent. We have an inertial force, which depends on U double dot, which is the acceleration. Um, uh, and uh, a damping force over here, and then a nonlinear stiffness, which depends on our uh, displacement column vector over here. So we've incre increased the complexity of our governing equation quite a bit. Um, but this allows us to consider two things, inertia and damping. So you can see that we have a kind of um, drop test of headphones over here, and the dynamic response of these headphones is considered. So the inertia and the bounce of these is considered as well. And that's not something that you're going to see in a static analysis. And this is also why I mentioned a chassis earlier that applying a static load on the front of your chassis isn't a crash test. You, for a crash test, you have to do a dynamic analysis. And you can see that as well, this um, kind of GIF here. This is a dynamic analysis. I think it was done in LS Dyna um, of a car crash. And you can see just how um, kind of exact it is. It kind of gets things very, very uh, well modeled. And um, so that will just give you an indication to the accuracy of FEA when it's done correctly. Um, so the most basic useful type of dynamic analysis, we don't really do dynamic analysis in former students um, because it's kind of outside of our realm. We're not really doing full crash tests or anything. Uh, the one place where we might use it is what's called a modal analysis. And this will tell you the excitation modes or the natural frequencies of our part. Uh, why is this useful? Um, because if we're experiencing difficulty with, with our FEA, sometimes parts that we think are connected to each other aren't actually connected to each other. So if we do a modal analysis, which will show us um, what the natural frequencies of this part is, and it will essentially shake the part for us, you can think of it like that, it will show us what parts are connected to each other. Um, so it's a kind of simple way of um, making sure that your geometry is um, connected in the way that you think it is. Uh, some, some of the people that have been in the FEA world for a while swear by doing this before an FEA simulation and use it before every analysis. Okay, that's the end of all of this. Hour and 50 minutes, 10 minutes shorter than the last time I gave it. Thank God. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess if anyone has any questions, fire away. But that's the end of the kind of material that I have. And you can post them in the chat or um, unmute yourself. But I guess the recording can also stop here, Katie. Thanks. Thanks for coming along. And then this is uh, just the final kind of summary slide. Thanks for ANSYS for sponsoring the team. Uh, they provide us with our FEA tools. Uh, thanks to N Topology as well for providing us with topology optimization tools. Um, if you 